We're going to talk about managing high data disease without a surgeon, which is always something that makes us physicians happy. Um, reminder of what, where the problem sits with these things. There's the definitive host and intermediate host because parasitology is hard. Um, I had a parasitology lecture in, when I was in my undergraduate time at UCT, he used to joke that every time he did this life cycle, he ended up with a carnivorous sheep. So we'll try and de decongest that. So the definitive host is where the adult form of the worm lives. Um, this is That's the adult form on the right there. They are between two and seven millimeters long. So they're very small. They're not these enormous tapeworms like you've sometimes seen. Um, and they live in the definitive host, which is a canid. And I'll show you that in the next slide. And then if the egg from that definitive host, they pass eggs, they pass thousands of eggs a day, each of those things. And they can survive in the wild and in the in environment for over a year in the right conditions, which is usually when it's a bit cool and a bit moist. They don't survive de desiccation very well, but they do survive the rest of it. So it really can be in the environment long after there's sort of any macroscopic feces left. The eggs are still viable. And if they get eaten by any one of the potential intermediate hosts, then in the intermediate host, it develops into a cyst, um, which you can see schematically depicted on the bottom right there. And then if the definitive host eats one of these infective um, cysts, effectively, they will that will form back into the next generation of the definitive host, the, the adult worm. The definitive host is a canid. A canid is it's a sort of dog family, but it doesn't have to be a dog. That's some of the other canids there are depicted in that picture. So wild dogs, wolves, jackals, coyotes, foxes, etc., uh, throughout the world. It has to be a canid, but it can be any of them. And many of them are wild. So you can see how it's quite possible to have this um, life cycle completed in, in, entirely in the wild. Um, which is one big way. So it's not, it's not just purely humans who get affected by no means. Um, and like I said, they have the adult worms and then they produce these eggs. These eggs are embryonated and they have this oncosphere inside it, which um, after a bit of development becomes infectious. The intermediate host though is very broad. So definitive host is quite restricted to one of the canids. Um, but the intermediate host can be pretty much, well, many, many, many of the warm-blooded mammalian animals. So there's sheep, there's a, a, a horse there, put a goat there, pigs, uh, that's a deer in the top uh, left over there and a cow on the top right. Um, and these are the intermediate hosts. And of course, by accident, though, um, they can include you. So it's really not that specific with intermediate hosts. You get a lot um, bigger range uh, with intermediate hosts than you do with the definitive host. So a human there is obviously not a, meant to be an intermediate host. Uh, we don't get eaten by dogs, even in South Africa. So we, it's really, it's really an accidental intermediate host. It's usually a dead end if it lands up in a human, or you hope it's a dead end. Otherwise, society's in quite a lot more dismay than you would normally think. Um, so usually it's sustained in these uh, in these animals. This was a nice systematic review from a few years ago that looked specifically at the SADC countries and looked at um, the canids, the intermediate hosts, and humans. So for the canids, if they study them by ELISA um, or EIA, basically the serology, you get about ten percent of them all you know all comers put together. Now obviously it varies a lot by which exact animals you're studying and where and what year, etc. But in general, over the course of the systematic review, about ten percent of the canids. That they were sampled were uh, ELISA positive, and if you looked at necro necropsy, so when they're looking, they're doing effectively an autopsy, but after after the animals, um, well, for, on the animal, about six percent of them are positive. So that kind of makes some sense. The serology would be higher than the actual visible cysts, but that's still quite a lot. And then if you look at the intermediate hosts, that, like I said, is usually done at least in the systematic review by direct inspection. So looking for cysts in this in the meat and particular parts of the animal. Um, and then if you look over here, for example, it's sheep and cattle were about 10% of those sampled. And this goes back decades, over you know, many decades of looking. Cattle about 7%, um, pigs 1%, and wild herbivores, so we think things like deer and, and antelope and that, about 9%. The only real estimate in the static region for humans came from a study, which I think, if I'm not mistaken, John Freen was part of it as well, but it was looking, it was done uh, about 15 years ago, I think, looking at uh, data from the NHLS based really at Baragwanath Hospital, uh, looking through serology, histology, and microscopy, um, with the denominator being the patients at Baragwanath, estimating about 137 diagnosed human cases a year. That's clearly an underestimate because that's the ones that are diagnosed. So clearly, if your doctor didn't think to send off serology or didn't biopsy or didn't do microscopy appropriately, then you're going to underestimate it. So that's probably the low level of, of what the true number is. That's the lower bound, if you like, of uh, that number of human cases a year. Uh, my guess would be probably 10 to 100 fold uh, more actually just goes undiagnosed because many of them never get to medical attention clearly. 
And then I pulled up the South African one specifically, because this is obviously SADC country overall above. If you look at the SADC, sorry, South African ones, you can see there the percentages, um, the numbers sampled, number that were positive and the percentages and how they diagnosed it. You can see this goes back, this review, all the way to 1930s. And you can also appreciate that from about 1945 to 1960, there was a huge amount of inspection going on, clearly, at least in the publication record. I'm, I'm sure they still do meat inspections, but not published as much since then. Um, and you can see the numbers hover around about 1% to 2% um, if you look uh, around that sort of level. So probably median there about 1% of those animals that were sampled, the cattle, the goat, sheep, pig, etc. Um, and then at the bottom there, there's the one of the antelope and one of the warthogs. Those are those Latin names at the bottom, um, looking by meat inspection, um, looking to see what percentage. But again, somewhere between 1% to 2% of these domestic and wild animals in South Africa probably harbor it, harbor it at least. Uh, by these studies that were done. The risk factors are fairly obvious, but uh, again, there was a nice meta-analysis that looked at this. Uh, all the ones in bold there with the odds ratio are the ones which were didn't cross one in the confidence intervals. In other words, they were so-called statistically significant. Um, and it's the big one. So the biggest one is dogs roaming around wherever you live. That makes sense, given the fact that canids are a huge part of the life cycle. It's also the, the, the roaming goes well with the second point there, which second most uh, powerful uh, risk factor, which is the dogs feeding on viscera, obviously. So that's how the life cycles uh, uh, continued, because most dogs, for example, domestic dogs in, in, in uh, peri-urban areas in South Africa don't, and rural areas, don't hunt the animals down. They usually have informal slaughtering uh, slaughterhouses, which, uh, for example, will slaughter the animal and throw the offal maybe in the street, or at least not dispose of it properly. And then sort of the intestines and other regions in the offal. And then those dogs would feed on that, the wild dogs. So you need this kind of combination of wild dogs and some form of informal slaughtering that happens where they don't dispose of the offal in the in the right way and that explains really most of those risk factors you can see there the slaughtering slaughtering animals at home like you might in rural areas is a big risk factor dogs uh, dog ownership slaughterhouses in the area um, even spelt that way and um, living in rural areas as well and and low income but those are probably confounded by the practices which are above and so the image you really need is this sort of image, which is from the IJID from 2009. But that's the sort of idea of it's a sheep. Clearly, it's been slaughtered. They've taken the best parts of the meat to sell or eat. But then that the leftover there is on the floor. And look at that dog sniffing around there. That's how the life cycle is going to be continued. The cysts in the offal, for example, are going to get eaten by that dog. And then the life cycle continues. So the natural history of these, that's the onchospheres. So that's what happens. So you've got an egg. Um, if you ingest it right, the onchosphere hatches from that in the right host, and then it'll penetrate the small intestine, um, and it'll go via the, the bloodstream or the lymphatics into usually the liver, because that's the first organ it hits, and then, and I'm talking about humans, and then from on the next or most likely organ is the lungs, because that's the next organ you hit. Um, as a human. And then it forms these cysts. These are what happens in the intermediate host. The cysts have those three layers. Uh, they've got an, um, an inside layer, which does the, the dirty work of creating this infectious forms, which I'll show you next. That's called the endocyst, and it's got this germinal membrane with the protoscolices. We'll show you more of that in a second. And then you've got a parasite layer, which is acellular, no cells, which idea is to sort of wall it off and really not provide much for the immune system to work with and provide some stability as well for the cyst. And then around that, you do have a little bit of a host reaction. Um, not much, clearly. Many of these things are diagnosed asymptomatically and, and really without um, troubling the patient much. But that, that last layer, the pericyst is host derived. So you've got a bit of collagen fibers, for example, um, and inflammatory cells. And that's, that's the, the morphology of a cyst. Schematically, it looks a bit like this. And I'll show you next why this maybe isn't best of the schematic photos. But really what the key thing here is this is germinal membrane buds off to form these brood capsules. And in the brood capsules form the protoscolices. Those protoscolices are the infectious things which um, will develop into um, either the definitive hosts, um, the, the, the adult form of the worm, or um, cause more cysts if it's in the intermediate host, if it gets spilt, for example. And then occasionally the, the more of the base membrane, sorry, the germinal membrane buds off and you have an entire layer. These are macroscopically much bigger. So that's why this diagram isn't great. But uh, they they actually form dortices. So dortices is basically like a replication of the entire machinery. These um, brood capsules are very thin walled and, and really just the job is to make protoscolices, whereas the dortices um, really recapitulate the entire structure of the of the, of the mother cyst, if you like, the parent cyst. <laughs> 
and also then will develop their own um, brood capsules potentially and protoscolices. And then from, they kind of go through a cycle, these protoscolices get ready, and then um, if they don't get eaten, this, they may get some degeneration and then degeneration at the bottom of the cyst with gravity, often you get this hydatid sands, which is kind of these degenerating protoscolices and hooklets at the bottom from previous attempts at going through the cycle. Um, microscopically, you can see this. So this is the three layers of the cyst. And then you can see these are the brood capsules. I hope you can see my cursor. These are the brood capsules, these big round bags, each of them containing multiple of these protoscolices. The protoscolices are, like I said, are the infectious things. They are the ones that really are the things that if you get rid of, you are no longer infectious anymore. But you can see how small these brood capsules are. And then when you zoom out a bit, that's when you start seeing these big um, daughter cysts where you can see this, this um, germinal membrane in the alveolar wall, but basically you've got this entire walled off segment, which is the, the daughter cyst. In them, you can see some of the brood capsules and protoscolices. So that's kind of the morphology of it. Um, this is an image from a sample, a case we had uh, last year, um, where, and, and you can see these are all the protoscolices, and you can see these row of hooklets. This is from the NHLS's um, uh, histology department, and you can see a little bit in the middle here, it's slightly darker color, brownish color. And you can see how nice they look on this one here at about one, two o'clock. Um, this row of hooklets, that's sort of invaginated and it pops its head out when it's becoming charged and infectious on the, like the one on the right. And you can see it's sort of popped out and that would be an infectious one, but they go through the cycle um, uh, really continuously getting sort of developing new ones and then becoming more mature. And you can see one hooklet um, side profile on the right there. Okay, so then it comes to what they look like um, by imaging. This is really important because, in fact, the imaging dictates management uh, almost at, at every level. So what this is a lovely article, which I'll, I'll share, share reference from the next slide, but it's really got a lovely comparison here of ultrasound versus MRI versus CT scan. And it's divided classically. Now, there's actually over 20 scoring systems. <laughs> But the one that's hit the most um, acceptance um, is this one over here, where this is devised, devised by the WHO after a lot of backwards and forwards and lots of uh, acrimonious debates uh, in the last few decades. But they've they've really labeled here from C1 all the way to C5, C is cystic echinococcosis. So there's obviously alveolar echinococcosis, which is a very different form of echinococcosis really in the Northern Hemisphere. I'm not gonna cover that at all today. So we're really only dealing today with a cystic uh, kind of cocosis, which is the one which we may see in, in, in sub-Saharan Africa. And um, and it's divided. So there's a CL, which is just sort of cystic lesion, if you're really not sure if it's even um, hydatid or not. But once you start becoming sure it's hydatid, you move into the CE classification, CE 1 through 5, with 3 divided into A and B. Um, and you can see there what, what it looks like in each um, of the other modalities. And I'll go through in a bit more detail what each one means, because that dictates in a very logical way, actually, how you're going to manage these patients. So for CE1 and 2, they are regarded as active. So CE1, and I will just make the point at this, at this stage, that the ultrasound remains quite surprisingly in some ways, but remains the best diagnosis, diagnostic imaging modality out there. It's still the gold standard. And I will show you why, in fact, some of the other ones, especially CT scan, can be quite inferior to ultrasound for this sort of thing. So it's still based on ultrasound, even though obviously we're getting broader access to other um, imaging modalities. So let's have a look at C1. C1 just looks like a simple cyst, but if you look closely, you might see this double membrane and you can see it over there in the middle um, where you get sort of this, this double line sign. And then there may be hydatid sand, which is this little collection of material, which again, if the patient moves around, you can see it moving a lot with gravity, which is really these protoscolices uh, that are moving around. CE2 is, is very similar, but you've now got daughter cysts involved too. So it's these multi-septated cysts, and you can see those daughter cysts very nicely um, on all the, all the imaging there. Then you start, they start naturally dying. So the old longest um, viable cyst that's ever been described in the literature is 53 years, but most of them will get about 10 years and no more before they degenerate, many of them long before that. So there is a natural history to these, even if you do nothing about them, which is important to know too. Um, here in C3A and C4, say 3B, they regard as transitional. So they've moved from active to transitional, and then the last form will be inactive coming up next. 
Um, and with the transitional forms there with CE3A, what you've got is you've got detachment of this membrane. So this is that, that germinal membrane and it's just detached and is now floating. And you can see that beautifully in all of these images here, floating within the cyst. Uh, where CE3B, you've got um, daughter cysts again, but this time compared to CE2, you've got a uh, mucinous or solid sort of matrix. And you can see how these solid components or at least mucinous. So they're not just these perfect uh, daughter cysts. Let's go back and just go back to look at how beautiful CE2 looks. And then if you move to CE3B, you've got the solid component to each of them. So that's, um, that's again, a degenerating system. And then you get to four and five, which are inactive. So they're, they're inactive because there are no protoscolices that are viable here. So in other words, even if you got that in another animal or another uh, person, or you spilt from the cyst, there's nothing to generate um, more cysts or, or the adult worms either. So the pro there's no protoscolices, which is really the, why we can be quite confident that C4 and five are inactive. And in C4, You've really, these are just, in this case, it doesn't really matter between C4 and 5, but um, in C4, technically, you've got these sort of canalicular structure, and you can see that nicely on the ultrasound again, almost like these dark track lines going through otherwise pretty um, solid or mucinous cyst contents. And C5, there's calcification. So calcification means it's it's dying. You've got dystrophic calcification. Um, there's nothing there to keep it viable, and the body calcifies it as it degenerates. So that seems like quite a lot, and it is. But in fact, when you think of it, if we just zoom through it again, there's a kind of pattern here. So you've got one big cyst, and then you may get daughter cysts, C1 and 2, those are active. By the time you start degenerating, they're still active. There's still some protoscolices, although not as many. Um, but you're starting to have either detachment of the membrane or development of sort of mucinous or solid components. And then you move to inactive, where you have really largely uh, mucinous or solid with some tracks in C4 or calcifications in C5. Okay. So that's the overall schema of that. Um, the interesting thing, like I said, is that this ultrasound still is the gold standard. Um, there's a really nice paper where they compared the CT and MRI. And it's interesting that um, certainly for, for up to stage four, ultrasound beats the pants of CT scans. So this the way to interpret this image is that you can got the ultrasound on the bottom and the CT scan on the y-axis. And so if they correspond perfectly, you'd get this diagonal line where the clustering is. So bottom, the two and two, three A and three A, three B and three B, four. So that would be perfect concurrent concordance. Um, and then if one is discrepant, then it starts sliding horizontally, for example, or, or vertically as the case may be. So you can see that there's really not a good enough concordance between one to four. Five, though, it's pretty good. And why is five good? Because CT scan is really good at finding calcification. CT scan is the ionizing radiation. It's very good at calcification. So for CE5, it's actually better than ultrasound because C, uh, CT scan will find more of it than an ultrasound will. But for the other stages, actually, your best bet is ultrasound. MRI does much better than CT scan. Probably as good um, for the early stages as an ultrasound, but by the time you get to four and certainly five, it's not as good because again, the MRI doesn't pick up the calcification as easily as ultrasound does, interestingly. Um, so again, just making the point that the ultrasound still is the gold standard and still um, pretty useful. And you can see some of these changes. This wonderful paper actually gave, so I showed you some of the perfect images correlations where you can see ultrasound, MRI, and CT scan, how they match up perfectly. But here is, for example, some of the imaging pitfalls, and you can see some of the problems. So for example, um, if I put this over here, you can see the double line sign makes it C1 very nice on ultrasound, but you might miss that on this MRI and CT. Notice again how where that arrow is, and you can see a double line on C1. When you look down, these are the same patient, just different imaging. At MRI and CT scan, you really can't see that double line. So it just looks like a simple cyst. Um, if you look, for example, at small daughter cysts, um, they can be missed by CT scan, but easy to see on ultrasound and, and, CT and MRI. So if you look at CE2, that's a small daughter cyst, easy to see where the error is, easy to see on MRI, CT scan, same patient, almost invisible. You can see this. So again, this is, this is, these are the worst case. I showed you the best case. I'm showing you the worst case. Usually there's somewhere in between, but just to show you why this might be difficult. Same for that detached membrane. You can see it nicely on ultrasound, nicely on MRI, but CT scan is hard. Look at C3A there. Very difficult. This isn't even an error. Can't even tell where it is. Um, and you get the same idea. Whereas, for example, by the time you get calcification, you can see nicely how CT scan at C5 at the end, it does really well. Whereas it's quite hard to see on MRI and a little bit less easy to see on ultrasound. So again, just making the proof really uh, that 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 is. And C4 is important. I'm going to show you in the next slide over here because um, 
well, you can miss you, uh, you can miss this canalicular structure easily on CT scans. If you CT them, you might think that just looks like a simple cyst, and you move all the way from CE4 down to CE3A or CE2, sorry, CE1. So it really does matter a lot what imaging modality you use. The natural history actually was debated for some time. You can imagine it's quite difficult to know um, that the staging means anything. Like, do they really pass through these stages? Um, or, or is CE1 definitely before CE3A? Or can you know can you go backwards? Can you go forwards? Um, this nice paper looked at that and I think gives the best evidence that the staging really is a valid staging system. In other words, you tend to move forwards, if at all, not back. This is, um, they looked at a lot of papers, but if you look over here, they followed these particular patients up for a median of 200 days, um, so a better part of a year, and they were looking at the, so at the before is at the, on the left here, on the, on the y-axis, on after is on the right, on, on the on the x-axis, and you can see where I've highlighted in yellow, that is, would be if there's no change, so before and after, so if you've, if before and after are the same, you'll follow again that diagonal line. If you're moving to the left of the of the highlighted line, then you've gone backwards in staging. And you can see you almost never had that in this cohort of, of really, I mean, there's 852 cysts there, or observations, I beg your pardon. I think it was nearly 300 cysts. And you can see you almost never go back. The only one that there were a few cases with is 4 to 3B. So remember what 4 is? 4 is when you've got the canalicular structure. 3B is when you have a daughter cyst or two. Now, now you can imagine that could be missed on ultrasound. So probably that didn't actually go back. It was just misclassified the first time. Because if you have a tiny cyst, you're already going backwards uh, and to C3B. So that, that's probably why a few of them went back. But you can see to the extent they progress, they progress to the right of the highlighted line, which is, means that they are moving further after than they were before. Notice another thing, though, that the natural history, uh, most of them don't change much. They don't tend to get aggressively worse or degenerate at a very fast rate. Remember, I said they live for years. Um, and you can see in the median follow-up of, call it two-thirds of a year, um, you really didn't see much change um, of them. Okay. And then, so how do you manage? There are four options. You have surgery, which was always the standard of, co of care in the in past decades, medical therapy, percutaneous treatments, or watch and wait. All four options are on the table for most people when you when you first meet them. And then it's about really trying to tell which is best. And this has really been the thing that's been exercising the people in the field and the, in the literature for the last few decades, is that there's often a, not a lot of high quality evidence to, to determine which treatment path is best. But I will show you the evidence we do have. And we're starting to get some places, at least. We're starting to get clearer answers as time goes on. So one of these papers was in 2018, and they looked at looked at all the treatment options in the trials and in the studies and some of the observational reports where they were looking at various different options for various different patients. Um, they found 11 randomized controlled trials and 22 non-randomized trials, so they were including some observational studies. For the non-randomized ones, they just did a qualitative analysis, but in fact, it, it bore it came to the same conclusion as the randomized trials. So from the randomized trials, um, if you look over here, there were three things which they could say fairly confidently. Firstly, is that it is worth treating them if you compare albendazole to placebo. In other words, leaving them alone uh, isn't as good in terms of response to treatment defined by either cure or improvement than giving medical therapy. This sounds straightforward, but it's good to check because it may be that these things die at about the same rate anyway, and it really isn't any point treating them medically. But it turns out there is. The odds ratio for cure or improvement was enormous, 25 uh, it was just statistically significant. Then comparing albendazole to mebendazole, which are the two of these anti-helminth drugs which are available, and I'll come to this a bit later, again, looking at response to treatment, again, albendazole seemed to do better than mebendazole in most studies. And I will show you why this is theoretically you know, posited to be the, the underpinnings of this, this biological phenomenon. And then if you added albendazole, including uh, to, to some sort of surgical procedure or percutaneous solution, uh, a procedure like PEAR, versus just doing the surgery or the PEAR alone. And in this case, they measured them by protoscolics non-viability. Again, the odds ratio favored medical therapy uh, in addition to those things. In other words, never just do PEAR or never just do surgery, but add some drugs to it. Now, again, those who've treated these people won't be surprised by any of the three things on here, but this is at least good quality evidence for most cases that um that this that we're getting places at least we know which which we we starting from somewhere at least we know something in terms of what to do and what not to do
So going through them in part, each quickly. So surgery, I said without a surgeon, so I'm going to give you precisely one slide. Um, it was the most common way of doing everything before we had these anti-helminth drugs, and it's taken a long time to be replaced. And I think in some ways we still in South Africa overdo the surgical options, and I'll make the case in the next few slides. Um, most commonly, it's either total or partial cystectomy, so total taking out the whole cyst, partial just taking debulking it. Um, but it's still unclear what the best solution is it, surgically. So whether you aspirate the cyst before trying to get it out, uh, whether you, how much lung or liver you take out as well with it, what you do about the residual cavity, like what about a ruptured cavity, you know, and, and sorry, ruptured cyst, you take that out. What, what happens with the cavity once you've taken the cyst out? There's still a lot of debate in the literature. Um, these are rough guides to the morbid morbidity, mortality, and relapse rates in surgery. Notice in liver, it's really not great. 32% of people have major morbidity, 8% mortality, which is 1 in 12, which is not great. And then about 20% in liver relapse rate. So not ideal. Now, clearly, this varies by site. It varies by, sorry, by surgical team. It varies by where you're doing it, how much experience they've got. So um, that's not to say that's necessarily the case wherever you're working, but this is the overall rough uh, approach to morbidity, mortality, and relapse rates in the literature. Um, lung tends to be better in terms of all of those three things. Again, there's a range. There's only a few studies reporting on these things diligently in the lung. So I just put the range rather than the median. Um, in there. You can see in some settings they get 0%, they claim at least, for morbidity, mortality, and relapse. Others, it's a bit higher, but tend to do worse when it's in the liver. And then there's complications, obviously. There's anaphylactic shock, which is fairly rare, but does occur sometimes if you spill the cyst contents. That's highly immunogenic, and, and in predisposed patients can cause anaphylactic shock. Um, if these cysts uh, talk to effectively or communicate with the bile ducts or the alveolar wall, respectively, if in the liver or the lung, you can get damage. So you can get a chemical cholangitis or chemical uh, bronchial wall damage. You can get spillage that causes secondary hydatosis. Remember, those protoscolases, if they're infectious, will happily make another cyst if they get spilt in the intermediate host. Um, and then you can get infection of the residual cavity. So you take out a big cyst, for example, but then you leave a big hole, and sometimes that can get infected. This is a case I've shown before in, in, in a, uh, many years ago, but this was a, a case of a gentleman from one of our hospitals that fed into us, and he they, they thought he had a pleural effusion, so they stuck in chest strain after chest strain after chest strain for him. Uh, only to then do a CT scan, which CT scan revealed this enormously complex uh, lesion, really taking up most of the lung on the left side there. With, and you can see there beautifully these the big cysts with the daughter cysts and even granddaughter cysts uh, within them. A little bit of calcification in some parts, so these parts were dying off, but clearly you're not going to win with anything other than surgery here. This is enormous and massive and has to be surgically um, taken out. So they did. Um, for what it's worth, the serology was positive, not that you need it. This image, by the way, is pathognomonic. If you see something that has these lovely daughters in them, that is hydatid, you really isn't anything else that looks like it. And then this is what came out. This is uh, from our surgery team uh, at Charlotte, uh, who took them out. And you can see those are some of the big cysts and some of the small cysts, and you can see what they usually look like. Um, and then that, um, the nice uh, Italian food look uh, to it was all of the small Many, many, I mean, there must be a thousand cysts in this bottle um, of all the stuff that they had to take out to get the, the hydatid out of his lung. Okay, moving very swiftly on, because I told you without a surgeon. One of the big advances has been looking at some of the percutaneous techniques. So doing it via the skin, in other words, not take open surgery, but actually percutaneously. The aim here is to do one or two things, and often both. Is one is if you destroy the germinal layer with a scolicidal agent, you've won, right? Because then the few protoscolices which are viable will die out in a short while and it won't, can't make more. So if you destroy the germinal layer, in other words, if you get into the cyst, puncture it and inject something scolicidal, you you render this thing not only dead, but also mostly importantly non-infectious. The alternative is to actually evacuate it. So you can just puncture it and just basically suck out most of the material, which also helps. And of course you can do both. The pair procedure, for example, has a bit of both. Uh, where some of the other condition uh, procedures have one or the other. So in comparison to surgery, it's as effective or more. Now, again, we don't have very high quality evidence on this, but to the extent the evidence is in, it appears just as effective or even more so. You definitely seem to have a lower complication rate, and there's a shorter stay, which makes sense. You can send the patient home the day of this procedure or the day after, as opposed to having to recover from surgery. 
there are some issues with this data. It's not not perfect data, so we definitely would benefit from a, a high quality data comparing them all. Um, but it's mostly done clearly in the abdominal cysts. You tend to, this is difficult to do in the lungs, obviously, because of risk of pneumothorax and other things. So really you're thinking mostly um, livo. And if you look there on the right in the table, the screen on the right, you can see what percent the complications are. And you can see, for example, even the major complications and recurrence rates are much lower than the figures I showed with surgery. So it's likely where you can do percutaneous techniques, and I'll show you where, it's better to do them. It's not just a difference of opinion. It's actually probably at least as effective, maybe more effective, but certainly with lower complications and shorter hospital stay. So you really should be prioritizing this where, where it's appropriate to do. This is a case we had just, uh, what is it, about a month ago um, at Helen Joseph where we did a pair procedure on this. And I just want to show you some of the images from this and some of the, um, some of the videos from it that, that came out of it as well. And thank you very much to, to Lauren uh, Richards, my a colleague at Helen Joseph Hospital for taking such good photos and videos. So I want to show you, this is what it looks like before. And if you think about it, what's what stage is that again? So you're seeing a big cyst here in the liver, but there's stuff in the middle. That's actually the detached membrane floating around. So that puts it a CE3A, if you remember from that picture. But this is a transitional stage. So, so you need to do something about this. Still not non-infectious, but um, it's the membranes detached. Notice how nicely you can see that on the ultrasound. It's a nice big cyst with a membrane detached. Look at our CT scan on the right there. Um, and here's the cyst again. And if you look very carefully, you can see that membrane. It's sort of serpiginous sort of line, you know, twisting um, thing there within the cyst. But it's hard to see, not as nearly as easy as ultrasound, which is making my earlier point about ultrasound actually being better than CT for these things. Anyway, in our case, the CT scan was done first because they didn't actually know she had a hydatid cyst. They were working up for something else. And the very good radiologist did notice that little detached membrane on the CT scan, so was able to call it. But we had ultrasound um, confirmation afterwards in this case, but showing it very nicely. Now, this was during the nightmare of the NHLS not having any results due to the hack. So we actually didn't have hydatid serology to prove before we did the pair procedure. But again, this imaging is pretty much pathognomonic. There really isn't anything here that does this exact look. So we felt confident enough to put it through the procedure without the serology as backup. Remember, serology is pretty good for liver, about 90% may be sensitive, but not perfect. You're going to get some where you're going to have to go on imaging, not serology. And we thought this was a good case for that. So um, what happened? So here's a little video. So this is the pair procedure, which our, uh, Dr. Chani, the nice ultrasonographer who was assisting us. Um, this is sticking... I think we've got, there we are, sticking the, the, the catheter into the cyst. So she's done on a sonar. She knows exactly where to go. And if you watch very carefully here, as soon as she puts it in, we double check again that the plane is moving in the right direction. So if you look here on the top left there, if you look as she wobbles it, you'll see that bit of skin moving up and down. Uh, let's get it a bit longer. And then, there we are. See that jiggle, jiggling a little bit around this region. That's her just putting the probe to make sure that it's, um, it's heading the right direction. Uh, so let's move on. And then um, this is now with her um, checking she's in the right place. So this is the cyst over here. And what you're looking for is a little dot, which is the end of the catheter tip, which she can wiggle up and down to show that she's in the right place. So here's the cyst. Here's the membrane in the middle that's detached. And if you look also in the, over here, you'll see in a second a little dot that moves up and down. Ooh, it didn't show it very nicely. Let's try again. It's also moving. There, there we are. Yes, Sorry, yes. that one. Yes, Let me show you one more time. So if if I, it's this dot here, which you're looking for. If you watch it, it jiggles as she moves it. So moving. There there we go. Go. Okay, so that's my information that I'm going to write. All right, so we're in the right place. So then what do you do? You aspirate the cyst fluid. So here she's going to aspirate. Um. This the cyst contents depend on the stage. So when they in the active phase, it, it tend to be quite clear. By the time they start degenerating a little bit, so as you move on through the stages, they get cloudier and cloudier. This is a three A, so this is somewhere in the middle, and you can see the fluid which comes out there is um, nice. It's a bit cloudy. I mean, you can see through it with you just hold it up to the light, but it's it's not pristine, wonderful cyst fluid. But that's that's what it looked like when it came out. Um, and that's what, this is two full bottles, that's about 100 mils there. Um, and you can see on the bottom here on the right one, there's um, some cyst material. So that's part of the membrane, which was actually sucked out, which is perfect. Like I said, we're doing two things here. We want to suck out as much as possible, and then we want to put in a scolicidal agent. 
So out there in the, in the bottle over here is some of the cis membranes. Uh, and then on the bottom, there's a urine dipsticks. And we use that to check for bilirubin. That's really important because you want to make sure that the cyst doesn't communicate with any of the bile ducts. If it does, you can't obviously then inject anything scolicidal because it will burn the bile ducts. So you want to make sure you're just putting it back in the cyst, not anything that's touching the bile ducts. So the recommendation is to test that fluid for bilirubin, at least by dipsticks, so that you can check the third one down is, is bilirubin and it's totally normal. So there's no bilir 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 uh, communication. This is our, our scolicidal agent. There's a long story for this, which I will tell some of you maybe at some point. Um, but just, to, and poor Dr. Sunny can can um, tell you more about it. details and her travails trying to get hold of this. This, it turns out, is hard to get. If you have a patient in you in Johannesburg and you need some shout, because it'll be hard for you too, and we have a bit more. This is 96% ethanol. So the WHO recommends at least 95 or greater percent. That's hard to find. It's not so straightforward. Anyway. That's what we're injecting. And then as I play this, what you're going to look for, let me just put it over here. In this region here is the cyst, but it's now mostly collapsed down because she's aspirated it out. So it doesn't look nice like a cyst like you saw before, but you, it's that region. Um, and then what the idea is here, you inject about a third of the volume that you took out, but you're, in, you're injecting now into it this escolicidal solution, like 95% ethanol. You can use hypertonic saline too, but it has to be 15, 1, 5% or more. So not the sort of one you'd use for nebulizing, for example, for the induced sputum, which might be 3% or 5%. This again is very hard to get hold of. There was none in any of the hospitals we tried, the 15%. So you're going to look over here and then what happens is as she infuses it through, it blushes and suddenly becomes white um, because it's very echogenic. So let's look in this region here. Give it a second. That's the liver and she's about to inject the scolicidal agent. Watch it change white. Oh, give it a second. There we are. Look at that. That's it. All right. So let me show you again. That's where you're looking. You're looking this region. And as she injects it, it suddenly blushes white. There we are. Starts filling with this fluid that she's just injected in with an echo shadow behind it. Okay. So with a new wait five minutes for the scolicidal agent to do its job. And then you re-aspirate because you don't really want to leave that stuff in there. So now she's, in this case, aspirating it out. Now you can see that that's now coagulated proteinaceous material because that 95% ethanol has done its job. And so it's a very different color. That's way cloudier than the stuff she took out in the first time. And it's way whiter. It's really just denatured protein and, and other things. So it's, it seems to have done a good job there. And we don't anticipate that any protoscolases survived 95% um, alcohol. If they did, they deserve a medal. So then we were very happy to um, be able to send this, um, this samples. And that's right, just on the right is afterwards. So before you can see very nicely, it's a big cyst with a membrane detached. On the right, you can see it's a collapse down now. It's really been aspirated out. It's now echo dense. You see the whiteness there. It's really not a cyst much anymore. So that's a good job. And then we were very fortunate to be able to send to the Parastology Reference Laboratory. I'm going to hand over in a second to them, and they're going to talk through some of the microscopy. So we sent one of these uh, bottles, in fact, both, I think, to the NICD um, and ask them to have a look and see what they said underneath. Very much hoping it would show how data because of course, otherwise we've done a pair procedure on someone who didn't need it. No, I'm mostly joking. Um, but, uh, and they got some absolutely stunning images. So um, I think, is it Charlotte? Are you you're gonna talk through them? Um, Jeremy, can you unmute uh, Bhavani and John? I'm not able to oh, do sorry. it. No problem. No, Charlotte should be able to unmute. Uh, make co-host, sorry, Bhavani, you are now co-host, you can unmute, and John as well, let's make you sorry about that. Um, so I'm going to, I've got a series for that you sent me some of them uh, today, so I'm going to go through them, you just tell me when you want to go to the next slide, whoever, whoever wants to talk. Hi, it's Bhavani, I'm just checking with Charlotte, I think she was going to, but I'm not sure she's got technical difficulties. Ah, okay. Um, just check with her one second. No problem. No problem. Oh, Charlotte says, please unmute. You should be able to unmute, but let me try and do it manually, Charlotte. Sorry. Uh, ask to unmute. So you should be able to do it, Charlotte. But maybe there's some technical issues. You are co host, and I have tried to unmute you. Otherwise, I see John's unmuted too. <laughs> Hi, Jeremy. It's Charlotte. I can oh, unmute hey, myself. Can you hear me? We can. Thank you. Okay, sorry about that. Yeah, so Bhavani, John and myself are on. So I'll start and I'm pretty sure they will add. So thanks for sending us these specimens. We did receive both those 
uh, bottles of uh, fluid material. And, and like you rightly said, you know, um, most of these cases are made or, or suspected radiologically, and the diagnosis is made by imaging and or serology. But um, we're finding that with the increasing use of uh, pair procedures um, in both the diagnosis and treatment of hydatid disease, we are receiving more hydatid fluid samples at our reference lab. And there's some cases, of course, where there are diagnostic dilemmas and fluid is also aspirated and sent to us. So um, what we do here is um, in terms of making a specific diagnosis of hydatid cyst infections, these are mainly based on microscopic examinations of the cyst fluid. So the material that you sent to us, we're going to be looking for presence of protoscolices, for hooklets, um, and when these are present or even absent, sometimes the fragments of the laminated membrane, which can be seen microscopically sometimes, as you pointed out, within that one bottle. So what we do is we usually do a wet, unstained mount of hydrated fluid sediment, which we examine. And that's what you can see here. So this is low magnification. It's a wet prep. And you can clearly see, and sorry, I don't have a pointer, but you can see at least three or four of the immature protoscolices. And then the one in the center, John and I were just discussing that, and that looks, so the others look um, everted or, or, or that they've opened up, but the one in the center that you can see the hooklets nicely, that looks probably still invaginated. Um, and, and that's basically, and then you can see all of the hooklets, three line hooklets in the background very nicely. And that's, you know, sufficient to make a definitive diagnosis. Uh, but sometimes when the material is scanty, um, there are other ways or other um, alternative methods to enhance the visibility of hydatid elements. So the other things we can do are looking under polarized light because hooklets are biorefringent. And then we can also um, try different stains. So hooklets are meant to be acid fast with the zeal Nielsen. There's some trichrome stains that um, can show them up better than the zeal Nielsen. Um, and then there's some other, um, you know, um, fluorescent light um, images that we can look at. So if you if you go to the next one, Jeremy, these are all just different um, stains of about the same. So this is also a wet prep, and you can see very nicely the protoscolex there with the um, row of hooklets on the top, very nicely seen in that one. And then you can see the free lying hydatid material and hooklets in the background. The next one, this here is we tried a Gimza stain. And I just want to say uh, thanks to Lisa Mingsan at Parasitology and Bhavani Mudli for taking these images. This is a Gimza stain. Um, and you can see uh, the hooklets in a certain uh, plane staining up there. And if you go to the next one, you'll see the same stain, but you can see the hooklets in a different plane. So beautiful images um, taken of the uh, hooklets of the, your patient's specimen. And the next one, um, now here we tried the Zeal Nielsen stain. So the hooklets didn't take the ZN stain up as nicely as we see in some textbooks, but but they did stain uh, mostly within what's probably like the the, the central medullary, intramedullary area of the hooklets. Um, if you move on to the next one, here, I think, is just also a wet prep showing the uh, really nicely the morphology of the hooklets, multiple hooklets in this. Um, and if we go on to the next, um, this again is the Zeal Nielsen showing up how the hooklets took up the stain. Now, we didn't we don't have a certain uh, frequency of uh, excitation filter in our lab. But if you actually do a Zeal Nielsen stain and then look at that under, I think it's a 564 or, or um, similar filter, then you'll be able to see these hooklets stain up a very bright red. Um, but we didn't, we don't have that available. We do have some other uh, frequencies. And I think if you put, if you go on to the next one, here you can see um, this is polarized light. So what's standing up very brightly there um, is a charcoal-laden crystal with the pointed ends. It's yeah, it's uh, quite big. But if you just move your cursor up a little bit higher, yeah, there you can see uh, the hooklets actually, um, which are also um, polarizing, but but not as bright as the charcoal-laden crystal. Um, if you go to the next one. Um, here we used a fluorescent microscope with the excitation filter 365, but you can see nicely there as well the protoscolices and then where the row of hooklets is, you can see it nicely um, fluorescing. The next one, 
Um, again, we used a fluorescent excitation here on the hooklets and they show up very nicely as well. And the next one, here's just a high power image of the modified ZN of the hooklet. So it did take up the stain and that was nice to see. Um, and then I think that may be the last one, Jeremy, if the, or are there more? Yeah. Okay, uh, so then just, happen. yeah, then just to add, um, I mean, we, we don't routinely offer um, vital stains to look for a viability of protoscolices, but um, these are available and they can be done. Um, and we, you know, methylene blue has been in the literature been used, eosin has been used. And um, these stains, basically, you can assess the viability of the protoscolices based on the acquisition or loss or retention of the um, dye. So if they retain the dye, then they're non-viable because normal protoscolices adsorb and then reduce the dye and then they lose the color. So uh, we did try, um, uh, Bhavani did try using eosin and actually most of the protoscolices retained the eosin. So it showed that most of them were probably non-viable. Um, and then just the other thing that we do offer here, which we didn't need to do um, is PCR and sequencing. So we have a pan molecular assay that can, um, if it's positive, we then go into sequence and we are starting up again our echinococcus a specific PCR, and we are also able to offer genotyping. So I'll stop there. I'm sure uh, John and Bhavani may want to add as well. Oh, sure, thank you. Um, anything from, from you guys, John and Bhavani? Um, no, thanks, Charlotte. Um, well, I think uh, that's, that's covered all that um, is necessary to say from the lab diagnosis point of view um I just maybe to add it wasn't done in this case but um uh, sometimes uh, these um suspected cysts are biopsied and then the histology the histopathology is very characteristic as you uh, as you as you pointed out earlier jeremy um with that laminated uh, sometimes all that's visible is the laminated membrane, but that's enough for a histopathologist to to make a definitive diagnosis, but obviously not not required in this case. Thank you. Um, anything from you, Bhavani, or, or are you happy for us to move on now? We, I, I, def I definitely want you guys to, to chip in at the end and tell me tell me what, what lies I've told the audience today, <laughs> if I've said, misspoken, or if you want to add anything. Um, but anything from at this point, Bhavani? Just happy with everything Charlotte mentioned. Just comparatively to previous samples we've received, um, this particular one was quite high. So most of the images you've shown were from direct um, sample, direct smears or with preparations. Okay, nice. Uh, Jeremy, just one thing from my side. Uh, you didn't mention if the patient, or maybe I missed it, if the patient had had... Uh, albendazole prior to the procedure they, they had yeah sorry i, I didn't mention okay. it it's gonna it, it's gonna come up but i but okay. i agree okay yeah, that, that's so, then, part of it. so that's probably why most of the protoscolices were probably non-viable when and also i think because of the issues with transportation the samples reached us about two and a half days after the procedure but yeah, yeah. thanks it was a very nervous two and a half days for me <laughs> afterwards in the middle of the lab crisis wondering if we could if, if they'd gone to the wrong lab or something but um we were very grateful when it got there and, and really really grateful for your your you and your team i mean this is these are incredible photos i mean for us at least to see don't often see them so nicely from from our side so it's wonderful to have support of such a good uh, peristology lab um so i'm just going to finish off just with the the medical aspects of it in a second and then we're going to have time for questions um at the end so um, I, well, I guess just before then, just to mention when pear is not great. So pear doesn't do well when you have multi -vesic. So when you have daughter cysts, basically, it doesn't do well. And that may, stands to reason. It's, you know, you, you can't puncture them all effectively, not easily. So when you have one big cyst like that, that's great. When you have multiple cysts, it doesn't really do well. Um, but there are people who've tried other percutaneous techniques in that case. Most common one is this MOCAT, this modified catheter technique, which really just basically and very simplistically is a large ball catheter, so bigger than the one we stuck in there with a cutting device and aspiration. So in other words, you basically 
sticking the catheter in, um, using a cutting device to basically mulch it up and then and suck it back out. Now, I'm sure um, those who actually deal with these um, procedures would be hideously offended at my description of them, but that's in essence what they are. So there are ways of doing it percutaneously, even with these ones which wouldn't be appropriate for pear specifically. And then lastly, medical therapy. So there's um, your big problem with medical therapies. They don't absorb these drugs very well. Um, they are enhanced with fatty foods. So that's one thing to remember, by the way, when you do give these patients these drugs, tell them to eat it with food, at least ideally with fatty food, but honestly, just even any food, because every food has a bit of fat in it, is really important to get good absorption. Um, it's quite erratic if you have it on an empty stomach. And that's important to the long-term outcomes and something that's not always well controlled for in the trials. Um, I, you remember from the beginning showing that in the randomized trials, albendazole did better than mebendazole. Um, and the reason probably is this metabolism difference, that they both pretty much completely metabolized in the liver when you ingest them orally. So you get this first pass metabolism, which is very extensive. In Mabendazole's case, it's metabolized to this poorly active form. It really doesn't work much. Whereas with albendazole, in fact, the first form it's metabolized to is also a good, good activity, this albendazole sulfoxide. Um, and then only later is it in, in metabolized even further to an inactive form. So it probably means probably the reason why albendazole gets much better systemic circulation. So albendazole is probably fine for the intestinal parasites, but once you leave the intestine and you need to get it a systemic level up, albendazole is going to be your drug of choice. And it does seem to matter if you look at those clinical trials um, in terms of outcomes. The one other thing to cover, of course, is the efficacy by size. Uh, the problem is really a surface area to volume ratio issue. So when you have a small, let's call it an abscess, and it, like because the same applies with antibiotics, this is a kind of general principle in infectious diseases. When you have a small thing, you have a relatively big surface area compared to volume. The surface area is obviously meter, centimeter squared, volume in cube. As you expand the diameter of that sphere, the surface area obviously goes up, but it goes up by the square of the, of the radius but the volume goes up by the cube of the radius. So you can see, for example, in these things with a diameter of four centimeters, the surface area to volume ratio numerically 50 to 34 is way higher than 450 to 900. So it's gone from about one and a half to, to one to half to one. So in other words, you struggle as you get a bigger thing in terms of surface area relative to volume. And that's important because volume is the cyst contents and that's what you need to get rid of, but you can only get drug to the surface area because that's the, where the blood supply gets to. You don't get blood supply into the into the, um, the, the system. That applies to abscesses too. And in my, many literature, it's amazing, sorry, much of the literature, it's amazing how often it coalesces around a size of about five centimeters, where anything less than five centimeters, often medical therapy is fine. Anything more than five centimeters starts to struggle progressively. That applies to abscesses, for example, which ones you need to drain versus just give antibiotics to. And it applies apparently to these cysts too, which is about that sort of line, it starts to become very difficult medically. This, by the way, is also applies in many other spheres in life. For example, if you drop something, the force downwards is proportional to the mass, which is a volume function, whereas the, the, so the, the air resistance is proportional to the surface area. So the forces can be quite different. If you have a human, the force down is a lot higher than the force up, which you know if you don't wear a parachute. Uh, whereas with a little mouse, for example, uh, you can the force down is, is less, but the force up proportionately is way higher because, again, it's got a much higher surface area to volume ratio. And then with the horse, it's the other. There was a very famous but very, very mad evolutionary biologist in the tw early 20th century called J.B.S. Haldane, one of the funniest people to ever write evolutionary biology theory. And he wrote about this issue that if you drop a mouse down a thousand yard mine shaft, and uh, on arriving at the bottom, it gets a slight shock and walks away, as long as the ground's fairly soft. Um, if you drop a rat, a rat is killed, a human is broken, and a horse splashes, which is his description. That, knowing him, he might well, it may not be hyperbole, he may have tried all of those things because he was that mad. But it's a good example of this issue with surface area to volume ratio. It's also the same reason why these tiny droplet particles uh, or aerosols particles can stay airborne, for example, in TB for hours and sometimes days, because again, tiny surface uh, uh, or high surface area to volume ratio in such a thing so small. Okay. How long do you give the medical therapy for after that digression? Um, if you're combining it with some percutaneous technique, you need therapeutic levels at the time of the procedure. The reason for this is if you puncture and spill, which you probably will, at least to some degree, it's really important to have therapeutic drug levels 
at the time of that procedure, time of that spillage. Because remember, you want these things, if they're viable, can make new cysts. So you get secondary hydatosis. So you really want it to be therapeutic at the time of the procedure and for some time after. Some authorities traditionally have advised much longer periods, like a week or longer. I will be bold, and I'm interested to see what the NICD experts think, but I don't think this makes any sense at all. In fact, it might be counterproductive. Many of the surgeons say that the longer you give it, the softer the cyst wall, and the more difficult surgically is, and the more likely you are to have spillage. So, for example, if you look at the Gorgas type course um, in South America, which deals with a lot of them, their surgeons say really maximum a day before. You just want drug level so that the, to help if you spill anything, so that you've got a, a drug which can start killing those proteoscolices immediately. Um, longer than that softens the capsule, but but again, you're not trying to cure it medically with this because the assumption here is you're going to cure it surgically or percutaneously. Um, if you're using it after surgery, which you should be using it to prevent secondary hydatosis, so let's say after this pair procedure, for example, we're done. Uh, how, what should you do? The WHO says at least two weeks. Uh, most authorities would say at least a month of albendazole. If you're using mebendazole, even longer, but at least a month afterwards. So again, your role here is to prevent secondary hydatosis because your assumption is you've treated it with surgery or percutaneously. And then if you're using it as medical therapy alone, so in other words, you don't use any surgical or, or, or percutaneous therapy, here, anything from one to six months is recommended. And the reason we have such a wide range is because the studies haven't compared them nicely, and it's actually unclear. Most studies probably have given for about three months, and there's no real evidence that anything more than six months is, is helpful. But again, this is actually absence of evidence rather than evidence of an absence of effect. So it's a lot of unknowns about the medical therapy. And if you look how well they do, and again, if you look, for example, this is one study, uh, but it's a representative one. This is one of the bigger and better ones out there. If they took patients who had small lesions, so in that case, in this study, less than three centimeters in the lung, or excuse me, less than 10 in the liver, uh, they gave them four months of albendazole, and they all did fine. Uh, they either stayed the same or got better. But um, if you look the mean time, and this is really important, from the end of treatment to the time you detect a cyst change, radiographically was nine months in the case of liver and 18 months in lung. In other words, you're giving the medical therapy for a period of time, but you don't expect it to have resolved by the time you stop your medical therapy. That's different to abscesses, for example, and it throws a lot of inexperienced clinicians off. You think you need to give it until you see resolution. That's not true, at least as far as we can tell from the limited evidence. You give it and then you the change will only become detectable radiologically. I mean, presumably you get degeneration straight away, but only radiographic change many months later, potentially. So you have to be patient after you've given a good course of therapy. The adverse events, you know, I'm just going to skip past them in the interest of time. And then your last approach, obviously, you can do is watch and wait. The logic for these is that many of the cysts are already becoming inactive when you first identify them. And once they start down that pathway, they really stop growing. They don't get bigger and bigger. And so they don't go backwards. Remember in that graph or that table I showed you how they don't, don't regress and get more active once they start becoming inactive. And so they don't cause any new problems. They can obviously be massive and cause issues where you have to address them surgically. But if they're quiet and they're already degenerated, there's no role to do anything better. They're already inactive. They don't have viable proloscotices and they, and they don't regress and become more active. Just be careful, because like we said, that implies that you've staged them properly with imaging, and that can be a bit tricky, especially with inexperience. And how long should you follow them up with? Well, no one knows, but in one nice review article, they suggested 10 years being adequate. That seems a very long time, but um, that's, in other words, just watching them, making sure that you did stage them correctly and that they haven't become bigger or something as they shouldn't. And so this is how I'm going to end off, because we're now pretty much exactly at four o'clock. Uh, this is the concept to take home, really, from all of this. And that it's an image-based, stage-specific approach. So it's not that well validated, but it's getting better and better evidence. And to the extent the evidence exists, it's on this slide. So surgery is really only first choice for the complicated cysts, things that rupture. If you have fistulas, if you have compression of the organs like that lung I showed you, remember, which was so enormously taken over. If there's hemorrhage or secondary bacterial infection. In other words, if there's another reason for surgery anyway, surgery is the way to go. Outside of that, surgery is not frontline for any cyst, as long as there's viable ways. The best validation of this, obviously, is in the liver, where it's much more easy to access for pair, for example. But if you look over here, CE1, where you've got a simple cyst, you need to give albendazole and all of these ones from active or, or transitional. So that's a given. But then you can do a pair if it's more than five centimeters. In other words, if you don't think medical therapy will be enough alone.
If it's CE2, you've got multi-loculated cysts. Remember, you can't then do a pair because too many locules, but you can do the MOCAT, the modified catheter technique, or something similar if you have access to them. Once you hit 3A, that again is this detached membrane, but one big cyst, that's the pair procedure I showed you. So again, if it's more than five centimeters of pair procedure is the way to go. If it's less, medical therapy alone might be enough. Obviously, you're going to add medical therapy in either case. Again, once you 3B, you've got too many cysts. Again, you need something like MOCAT with medical therapy. And then the inactive stages, four and five, are just watch and wait. So the reason to watch is because you might have staged them wrongly. But if you really have staged them correctly, they shouldn't progress and they should only regress. And there's really no role to do anything about those ones. Um, lungs are hard because the imaging is not as reliable. You often can't get, because you only have CT scan that's easy. You don't have ultrasound as easy. Percutaneous interventions might not be possible depending where the cyst is, but increasingly people are trying them anyway. Um, it's clear that medical therapy works for most of them. Um, and the efficacy is obviously better with smaller cysts. Unknowns still to be determined in the literature are really two big things. The comparative efficacy for each of these interventions by stage. We need better data on that. I've shown you the best summary, but they, there's certainly holes that need to be plugged. And then one thing I'm not going to touch on is this role of prosequential. There is some limited evidence that dual therapy may be better outcomes, but it's quite weak evidence at the moment. And it's not really recommended as a frontline recommendation in any of the guidelines. So I'm going to end there. I'm just showing you the spectrum to make sure we've hit the right notes. Here is lung. This is a cyst here, and you can see another one at the top here on lateral, easy to see. This sort of thing, it's under five centimeters. What would I do here? Medical therapy alone. Nothing else, no surgery, no percutaneous treatment, medical therapy alone. What about this one, which I showed you? This is now a bigger cyst, more than five centimeters. So I can't just do medical therapy, but it's a stage which I can get from pair procedure. I'm going to do a pay procedure. Here's the stage 3, 3A that we used. And then lastly, when you have a lesion like that, this was a patient just from a couple of months ago, biggest tight added cyst containment I've ever seen. It's taken up his entire lung and most of his liver. That patient needs surgery. So that's the spectrum of our disease. And I'm going to end there. Thank you very much. I'm, no, I'm a little bit of time and I apologize for that. And sorry, it's gone a little bit over. I just want to quickly go through any of the questions. So some people have put MP number, CPT points, just use the link, please, which Lawrence put there. Um, uh, John, you've got your hand up. Do you want to add while I read the read the questions? Thanks. Uh, just um, a footnote, really, Jeremy, and that is um, going back to your original um, life cycle information. Um, there are some species which uh, use cats as in as definitive hosts uh, cool. specifically in south africa we've got um echinococcus felidus which and the natural uh, definitive host is the african lion and um in other parts of the world there are other species of echinococcus which um, utilize felids as well as a whole range of other animals so just um just uh an unimportant but interesting fact. <laughs> Very interesting. Thank you, John. So um, the African one, the South African one, seems to cycle mainly between uh, lions and warthogs. Oh well, okay. It's a very well-traveled um, life cycle in every every direction. <laughs> um, cool. And then uh, Leo's just asking, how do you know about biliary tree communication? So th that way, the recommendation is, so you can do this before, you can do, uh, as you said, fl fluoroscopy and other things, but in general, the size is, is a good indicator. Once you hit more than about 10 centimeters, those cysts are, are basically communicating with bile ducts until proven otherwise. But um, it is safe, because remember, you can puncture it safely. I mean, obviously in the right setting, but the injection of the scolicidal agent, at that point, you really do want to make sure, and at a minimum, it's a dipstick to make sure that you don't have uh, bilirubin on the dipsticks. Um, you can send it all formally for bile, um, you know, uh, bilirubin in the lab, but that's obviously seldom practical. Um, then Helena is saying, in children, we often see giant pulmonary cysts. Is there adult on lung pair for giant cysts? Um, is, do you mean, do, is there evidence for pair procedure in the giant cysts? Is that right, in, in adults? So there's some, people have done pair in, in pulmonary ones too. Clearly, you have to just manage the pneumothorax aspect of it. Um, which uh, depends, you know, where the cyst is and how you're puncturing it. But and it's again, it's not an absolute contraindication either. People are getting used to it, but it's a lot lower down in terms of experience than the lung, sorry, the liver ones, because obviously that's a lot easier to access, like we've seen. Um, 